Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 26 of the Healthy Gut Podcast, and today I'm joined by Lee Holmes, who is a holistic nutritionist, yoga teacher, whole food chef, lifestyle food channels healthy eating expert, and author of the best-selling books, Supercharged Food, Eat Your Way to Health, Supercharged Food, Eat Yourself Beautiful, Eat Clean, Green and Vegetarian, Heal Your Gut, Eat Right for Your Shape, and Supercharged Food for Kids. She has been a very busy author. Lee also runs a four-week online Heal Your Gut program. Lee has been featured in multiple publications and you can find her blogging over at her website, superchargedfood.com, which encourages soul food, which stands for sustainable, organic, local and ethical. And it features delicious recipes, information, news, reviews and menu planning ideas to make it easy for people to enjoy a satisfying, wholesome and nourishing diet. On today's interview, Lee and I talk about her four phases of gut healing, what they are and how they work, and why she works with her clients on these four phases. Also, we talk a lot about eating for gut health. Lee shares her own experience with recovering from a pretty extreme and chronic illness with us. And she shares some delicious recipes with us as well. So I hope you enjoy today's episode with Lee Holmes. Welcome to the show, Lee Holmes. It's wonderful to have you on the Healthy Gut Podcast today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So I want you, I'd love for you to talk about your journey um, as to how you came to be, who you are today. You, you've uh, got this wealth of wonderful cookbooks and you've got a heal your gut program, but you yourself had a very similar journey to myself in that you once were pretty unwell. So are you able to tell us what happened and, and how you came to be a picture of wonderful health now? Yeah, exactly. I did have a very similar kind of story to you, actually. It happened for me. It started about seven years ago. I was working in Sydney. I was a single parent at the time. And I remember I was working full time at the ABC. And I remember waking up one day thinking, I'm really tired. I feel like I can't get out of bed. And then I noticed that there was clumps of hair on my pillow. Like I would wake up, wake up in the morning and there were just lots and lots of clumps of, of hair there. My hair was really thinning. And then I started to, to develop these hives which covered my whole body. And so they were so super itchy. And then I was a pretty healthy sort of 57, 58 kilos. And I went dropped down to 40 kilos within about six weeks. All I just couldn't retain any food. My gut wasn't working properly. And from there, I kept on going to work as you do uh, until one day I really couldn't go on any further. I felt like I had chronic fatigue. I was absolutely exhausted. So I went to the doctors and I went through what I found to be a really complex medical system. I went from doctor to doctor, lots of specialists, more scans, more clumps of hair until eventually it took about three or four months. I was diagnosed with a non-specific autoimmune disease and fibromyalgia, which is, I don't know if you know much about that, but it's an arthritic sort of type condition. It feels like arthritis where you get really stiff and in the morning you have to have a hot shower to sort of, you know, uncrease all your body and your bones. It's actually a muscular thing. And yeah, you just feel really, really stiff. You feel like a 90 year old woman. And from there, I was actually given a a cocktail of different drugs. So immunosuppressants, anti-inflammatories, antibiotics, lots of steroids high dose steroids and I lived in a bit of a blur for a while because the side effects it was hard because I couldn't differentiate between the side effects of the medication that I was given and the symptoms of the autoimmune the non-specific autoimmune um, that that was happening and I asked them you know is there a name for this autoimmune thing that I have and they said well you know it kind of cuts across a few of them and apparently there are hundreds of different autoimmune diseases I didn't know anything about autoimmune when I when I got sick and um, so I said to them, 
I'd previously studied in my early days food and nutrition and I'd been to cooking school and I was interested in cooking but I never really did and nutrition anything with my qualifications. And so, But I did notice that when I ate certain things, my symptoms would really flare up. So, for example, if I had too much sugar, my hives would become really itchy. I remember I would be sitting at work and I would have ice packs taped to my body because my, my hives were so itchy. And then um, other things like gluten, if I eat gluten, I noticed that my gut would really hurt and I would get lots of tummy pain and constipation or, or diarrhea and it just wasn't, nothing was really kind of working and I was so unsure about what was going on. So I spoke to the doctors and I said, do you think maybe diet, it could be diet related? And it was about seven years ago and I think now doctors are more integrative and they lo- know a lot more about how diet and food can affect certain um, things in your body. So Back then, they said nothing to do with diet at all. Just keep on eating the hospital food. And the hospital food was not that pleasant, might I add. It was like stale white bread, plastic cheese, plastic ham. Everything was white. Lots of those desserts with every every number under the sun. So uh, I did a deal with them and I said, look, if I change my diet and just take a few things that I feel are irritating me out of my diet, can I... If I do feel better, can I slowly wean off the medication? And they said, fine. So together we kind of worked together on that. And um, eventually after about a year, I was off all medication at all. And the things that I sort of changed in my diet and took out of my diet were all the irritant foods. So for me, things like MSG and lots of sort of chemicals and additives that are in processed foods, which I was eating a lot of before. I was in a busy job. I was a single parent. I would just, you know, get some processed food, processed meals. They were the things that were irritating me the most. And then there were other things um, such as the sugar, the yeast was a problem at the time dairy was a problem I'm okay with it now but and gluten was a problem too so I did cut those down um, and out some of them out of my diet at the time and started to feel so much better my energy started to come back my hair started to grow back my skin was better my eyes were brighter and I definitely felt that I was feeling a lot better And from there, I had been to the movies and I went to see the movie Julie and Julia. And it's about a girl, a blogger, who um, cooks her way through Julia Childs' cookbook. And I got really inspired by that movie because seven years ago, no one was really blogging um, that much. And I I was like, I want to be that girl. I want to start a blog. So I got onto WordPress and I started a two or three page blog. It was the smallest blog put up my recipes because my friends and family wanted to share them. They noticed that I was looking better and feeling better. And my recipes are very simple. So I use just everyday ingredients from the supermarket. There's nothing too expensive or anything you have to trek to the Venezuelan rainforest to find. Um, And so I put them up and it was quite incredible the amount of people who contacted me from all over the world and said, that was my story. I was on steroids. I blew up like the Michelin man. Same thing happened. Took a few things out of my diet, tested my diet, took out the trigger f- foods, changed my lifestyle a little bit, and I felt a lot better. And so we started to build this amazing community of people who were very like-minded and we would inspire each other. And that's kind of how I started blogging and started writing books. And it's uh, a very much a happier place in the world that we've got your cookbooks. <laughs> You've got some great recipes. It's so interesting hearing your story and I know that for many of my listeners they've had a very similar journey and quite often we get told we've got these sort of non-specific illnesses where Mm. doctors are saying I don't really know what's going wrong so I'm going to give you this diagnosis that gives you a diagnosis but it still doesn't really tell you very much. Interestingly uh, fibromyalgia is a very common condition associated with SIBO. So quite, I don't know, many of my listeners uh, will be experiencing that. So they'll, they'll be uh, smiling, perhaps not in a happy smile, but in a knowing smile of you know, trying to r- crinkle yourself out in the mm, shower in warm yeah. water. Yeah, absolutely. And I found that when I did change my diet and lifestyles um, significantly, I found that my symptoms really improved. And I think one of the biggest triggers for for me for fibro is stress. And I was in a very stressful job as well. So it wasn't just about the food I was eating. It was a bit more of a lifestyle change that I had to undertake as well. 
And I think that's often something that's not addressed and it should be when we're going through the traditional medical system um, in that lifestyle has an enormous impact. So our stress, our sleep, who we're spending time with, if we're in toxic relationships, often that will be having a toxic impact on our bodies. And no one talks to us about that. Quite often we get to that point when... We're looking for alternative solutions when people are coming to, you know, the likes of yourself and myself and and other more alternative um, health practitioners or coaches or um, the like who are able to come at it from a different perspective. Because unfortunately, I I still think today many of our doctors um, will not look at that first. They'll be looking at what treatment you need for your symptoms. Mm, absolutely. I found a, a lot of that, although I do think it's changed a lot now. I noticed that I really loved connecting with people who were going through the same thing as me as well. And there's so many people out there with different autoimmune issues. And it was nice to be able to feel like I wasn't alone because at the time I felt at the very beginning, I felt really alone. And I felt like I was in a system that didn't really understand me. And although those drugs and treatments are really good, like steroids are great for saving lives, for me, for a long-term kind of condition, I wanted to try and get to the root cause of why that happened to me. And so I really looked back and I looked back to when I was about 16. And I remember at 16, I had a lot of cystitis. I would have one attack after another and I was put on six courses of antibiotics, one after the other. And I felt that that was where my health started to really start declining. I had wiped out all the good flora in my gut and microbiome. I got very interested in the gut. I did some gut research. I went to India. I studied Ayurvedic medicine and nutrition over there. And I learned a lot more about the gut. And that's why I wrote the book, Heal Your Gut with the recipes, because um, I felt that I was, I didn't want to just mask all the symptoms with medication. I wanted to get to the reason why this was happening. And for myself and many of the listeners, we've all experienced that was just bombardment of antibiotics. I think um, I myself had years of antibiotic use in an attempt to try and clean up acne, which I now know was coming from my gut. <laughs> really? Um, being a premature baby and having, you know, antibiotics pumped into me from day one of my mm. life. So my, mm. my little gut microbiome really didn't stand a chance. And then getting constantly sick because I didn't have a good immune system because there was no immune function operating well in my gut because my gut was so compromised and um, I think that you know it is great that there is more awareness around um, that we should be looking at not using so many antibiotics Uh, but you know I think for many people um, particularly uh, you know those that are um, perhaps my age and older that have been and I'm nearly 40 um, but those that have been around in a system where we were given antibiotics for just the slightest cough or cold and um, we've done a lot of damage, I think. Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm 50. I'm turning 50 in a couple of months. And I, yeah, I mean, with if you had, you know, a sore tonsils or a sore throat, you were given antibiotics if you have cystitis, whatever you had. A lot of the times you were given antibiotics. And I think that I do think that actually did contribute to Um, why I started to feel really tired and really unwell. The other thing that you raised, which I think is really important and and I'm passionate about uh, in in my lifetime being part of change is hospital food and also aged care food. Um, I've experienced enough hospital food in my lifetime from being in and out of hospital um, with various operations and also sadly having to put my grandmother into an aged care facility because she was experiencing dementia. And seeing the quality or lack thereof of food that appears in those places, in places where we should be nurturing and and healing um, both our elderly and our sick and instead we're giving them just the most horrific toxic plastic food the most man-made food possible there's no natural anywhere in those places and it's so sad I absolutely agree with that I, I was so passionate about that recently actually that I started a petition on change all about the food in New South Wales hospitals I ended up doing a talk on radio with the Minister for Health she's not the Minister for Health anymore I don't think but um, and she said that she had already been rolling out new menus that looked at people who had gluten intolerances and 
better food choices in certain hospitals across New South Wales. So hopefully things will change. I have looked at studies in England and a lot of the problems are there's, uh, you know, it's at a government level, but it's also at a level where they have contractors that come in and, and, and it's a financial kind of situation. But there's studies that have been done and um, things that have been done in England. So in England, there's a hospital that has just started getting in local suppliers, so local yogurt, local suppliers, and it, it has actually worked out cheaper. If you go online, you'll be able to find it. It's, um, yeah, if you just research hospital food in England, you'll be able to find it. But that's quite interesting. So it's not always a cost thing. I think sometimes, yeah, if there's so much to be done, and, yeah, it's an area I'm really passionate about too. Well, I've experienced the side as, as the contractor. I worked for um, one of Australia's or Australia's biggest catering companies that did a lot of food service into hospitals and and care facilities and schools so I know what it's like at the other end when as the contractor they're looking at what they can get for the best value per it's not person. about is it the like best quality one dollar per meal or something <laughs> yeah, it's pretty low I can't remember exact figures but and I was lucky I worked in a premium division of of that and I, so I worked on premium catering rather than uh, hospital catering but I did used to you know I so I can I can understand why the suppliers are looking at how they can make the best margins. They're not thinking, um, in most cases, of the output with the patient. They're not thinking about quality of life or quality of food necessarily. They're thinking about margins. Mm. And I think that that conversation needs to change with governments and hospitals and then their suppliers that one of the key drivers is that it's about quality of food, locality of food, you're using good quality produce as the first instance and um, and then, you know, being able to make some money off it. And I could do an entire podcast where I rant about my views around this, but I think that it is something that we need to be conscious of because as we all age and we're living longer, uh, we're going to um, – many people will spend time in hospital and they'll mm. also – uh, many people will end up in an aged care facility. So we need to be thinking about how we're going to treat our people as we progress as a growing society. And when you do think about hospital and hospital foods, if, you, if you're if you giving, you know, even just better broths or bone broths or soups or really easy to digest foods with great nutrients and ingredients in them, the hospital stays are going to be a lot less. So it's going to be less of a strain on hospitals anyway and they can have obviously – uh, treat more patients and it'll be a lot more um, efficient. But uh, yeah, there there are a few steps, I guess, before that. There are. You and I are very much aligned in our views on these things. <laughs> so you have four phases of gut healing. I'd love for us to start talking about, um, you know, the work that you do around the gut uh, and what those four phases are and how they work. Yeah, absolutely. So I have an online program called the Heal Your Gut program. That's a four-week program. And then I have a two-day program as well for people that don't want to do it um, in a four-week block and a book called Heal Your Gut. And when I was looking at – when I first was looking at my gut and why I thought that I was experiencing all the issues that I that I was having, I wanted to try and do it in a way that was really simple. And so when I went online, there was so much conflicting advice, but there wasn't that much to do with the gut, but there was a lot of conflicting av- advice about what to eat eat and how to eat and when and and that kind of thing. So for me, I, it was trial and error. So what I did was I divided it kind of into phases. And the first phase was that I went on a very easy to digest diet because I knew that I was exhausted and tired. I wasn't digesting properly. I needed to have foods that were really easy for me to digest, things that my immune system wouldn't trigger on. And so for me, those things were things like smoothies, bone broths. This is seven years ago. Soups, slow cooking, mash bowls, things that are well cooked, nothing raw raw I it was problematic for me I found it really hard to digest and so for four weeks I had a very sort of elemental ish diet in the sense that everything was already blended and pre-digested for me I felt that that really gave the chance for my immune system to have a rest and for my body to rest and then I started to look into foods and foods that would really help to heal the gut lining. So things like gelatin in the bone broth, a clean diet, aloe vera, slippery elm. I started to introduce foods like that into the diet. Then phase two was all about cleansing the body. So once I'd rested the gut, 
I took about cleansing it and that's when I was over in India and learnt things like oil pulling and dry body brushing and Epsom salts baths and ways that you could naturally and very affordably um, cleanse the body. So I did that as well and I kept on the clean, the cleanish diet as well. So that kind of helped me with the good fats just also continue to cleanse my body. And then phase three of the program was that I'd rested the gut, I'd cleansed the gut. It was all about then repopulating the gut. So I had a diverse microflora and microbiota so that I would put back all of those um, good bugs that I needed that I'd lost after all the antibiotics that I was taking. I mean, with your gut flora, there are so many different um, ways of it for for it to be depleted things you know our food our processed foods our environment smoking alcohol antibiotics there are different different ways chlorine in the water um, and so for me um, putting the repopulating the gut was all about taking it really slowly I had I started fermented foods but I also have histamine intolerance so I had to be really careful with fermented foods so I did it really really slowly I also took a probiotic at the time and I found that helped as well and I ate more prebiotic rich foods things like um, uh, green beans and chicory and dandelion and a little bit of chocolate as well which is quite good for the gut Um, and I developed more recipes around those really great um, prebiotic and probiotic rich principles as well so I started eating like that and then the fourth part of healing the gut that I talk about a lot is the way Uh, I've actually just run a really big Heal Your Gut Summit with doctors from all over the world and scientists from America and England and Julie Enders who wrote the gut book was part of it too. And a lot that came out of that was about gut diversity and how we should have a very, very diverse diet, a high plant-based kind of diet as well. So another thing that came out of it was the link to the gut and stress. And so phase four of the program is all about finding those areas in your life that you can either work on or finding ways to reduce the stress that you feel. Because the stress stress does have a major impact on your gut and it can strip the body of good bacteria. So things like meditation, I became a yoga and meditation teacher. So I um, started to integrate that more into my life. I started walking and I started to, you know, a lot of us with autoimmune are A-type personalities and we're perfectionists and it's hard to um, be us. (laughs) It is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so you have to just let go. It's about letting go and just not worrying too much about things, about everything being perfect. So uh, there were things that I had to learn um, about myself and um, that was the fourth phase of healing the gut. I think it's quite funny because before we started recording our interview, I was saying to Lee that I was a little bit of a control freak and I am a total type A personality and it is often really hard just to switch off and it's something that I have have had to work hard at and uh, maybe hard is not the right word. I've had to work at uh, and it's something that I do, I focus on every day because if I don't focus on it, I can very easily go back to that old state that I used to operate in of high stress lack of sleep, long days, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's not healing. Yeah, and that and that's kind of when a lot of people resort to stimulants like coffee to keep them going or energy drinks, and you kind of caught in a vicious cycle, and so that's why, yeah. So every day I like to go for a walk in the morning before I start work and at least do something every day to try and just switch off and, um, yeah, just appreciate and enjoy the moment. So that very first phase that you talk about is is where so many of my listeners are at at the moment, which mm. is really about helping calm the gut down, mm. calm the inflammation down, and and just get some simple nourishing foods in the in their system. Um, you talked about bone broth, and for some people, and it's interesting to hear that you um, have had um, histamine intolerance because for some people, bone broths um, can actually be problematic with yeah, the histamines. Absolutely, how did Especially you cope? If they're cooked for a really long time. Um, I did my bone broth just for a few hours. They don't have to be a 24-hour slow cooker marathon. Um, so, And I did things like um, gelatin. So I would use gelatin in, in a custard in, in my recipes. I would have aloe vera jelly. Um, slippery elm was really good for me. It kind of really soothes the lining. And I felt like part of my autoimmune was Crohn's. They did say it's partly Crohn's. And I felt like the ulceration that I had needed to be calmed down. And that's why I kind of focused 
on those foods. And it was trial and error though. I've made mistakes, you know, as you do along the way, you eat something and then you're like, oh, I'm in pain, that hurts. So, it, and everyone is different. There's no one set rule for everyone, I think. So it's just really about identifying A, the foods you're addicted to and B, what is triggering you. But I think in general, if you can eat whole foods and something home cooked and something cooked even or um, easy to digest, whatever that may be, I think that's a good rule to start with. And what's your advice um, for people listening on how to find the foods that do work for them and those that don't? Did did you develop a a method or a system to help spot, oh, okay, well, it's that particular ingredient that does seem to cause me flares? Yeah, I did actually. I did a food diary in the beginning and I didn't want to get too sort of, you know, um, anal about it or anything like that. So I just did it very gently and very simply. And I looked at some of the really big trigger foods and I knew that MSG and some of the additives in foods were a big thing for me because I noticed that straight after eating them, my hives would really, really flare up within like you know, 15 minutes, I would have welts all over my skin. So I knew it was something I was eating. And as I got more natural with my diet, that would happen less. So I knew it was obviously those kinds of things. Uh, I just, I did, it really just took time. It really did. And it's boring, you know, it's really boring. And I didn't want to get too hung up on it either. Because obviously, if you have your diet under a microscope or um, a magnifying glass, it's stressful and you don't, you have no quality of life. So if I did eat something that made me flare up, I just rolled with the punches and went, okay, let's just try something else tomorrow. And so I wasn't too, I didn't put too much pressure on myself to find those foods instantly and change my diet completely. I think that's really great advice and for so many people that, you know, we can become very fixated and I was in this zone where you'd have a flare and you'd kind of beat yourself up. You're like, why did I eat that? I shouldn't have eaten it. What was it? Oh, it's all my fault. And I think that makes it worse because we go into a very stressed state which causes the gut to be even more distressed and there to be more inflammation and therefore the response is even greater. Absolutely. I mean, you go into the sympathetic nervous system then and you start to – I mean, sometimes eating – the stress of not eating the pizza is actually worse than eating the pizza itself. That's what my little motto is. So – in the very beginning when I was really sick and I couldn't take anything at all, it was just very gentle, easy foods. It was almost just like I was eating chicken soup and things like that. But as I progressed, um, I just did it, yeah, as I said, really slowly and gently and did it without putting pressure on myself. You talk about detoxing the body and you've talked about oil pulling and dry brushing. For anyone that's listening that doesn't know much about those things, can you sort of talk us through how they work and and what you actually do? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm half Indian. So um, when I was really looking um, at the different ingredients and things that I could do to really cleanse my body, I went over to India, to Kerala, and I studied Ayurvedic nutrition. And some of the ways that they love to cleanse over there, one of them is oil pulling. So traditionally in India, they use sesame oil and they take a tablespoon of sesame oil and they put it into their mouth in the morning and they swish it around and they can do it for long periods of time. Me, no, five minutes maximum. Like I just don't want to spend my time doing that like for a long period of time. But a lot of people here in Australia use coconut oil. So it's as it's very anti fungal, antiviral, antibacterial, it's good for, they say that the gut and the mouth, the um, bacteria in the mouth is very connected. So if you clean that by oil pulling, it helps to draw all the toxins out of your body. So I did do that and I found that very beneficial. There's tongue scraping as well, which is an Ayurvedic practice. Um, I kind of embraced those methods because I don't know whether it's because I'm half Indian, but I felt they felt quite natural to me and I did notice. But you don't want to get too hung up about everything either. So I kind of generally kind of did those as well and I also I'm a sucker for an Epsom salts bath so half a cup of Epsom salts a few um, essential oils in the bath that's a nice way to relax I think so yeah I think it's wonderful and and it just gives you a chance to have you time it's Mm. just you know maybe it's even if it's only 10 or 15 minutes that you can sit in the bath Uh, that 10 or 15 minutes is a great time I know that I can feel myself just completely de-stress I think you breathe better 
you're lying in this gorgeous warm water and you've got all this Epsom salts doing their work and it is just blissful. And I think that, um, you know, those that have baths in their houses and can actually do it, I think that we should be incorporating baths as mm. regularly as we can. <laughs> I agree. And it's very affordable. Like Epsom salts um, in Australia are only a few dollars a packet. So it's a good way. The magnesium sulfate, it draws the toxins out of your body. So that's a good way to sort of cleanse as well. And obviously a clean diet is good as well. Dry body brushing. I started to look online of ways that I could really sort of detox as well. And I had, an, and when I was very sick, I had adrenal issues and I was looking into that and I found some ways that dry body brushing stimulates your adrenals and it's good for sort of cleansing as well. So you brush in the direction of the heart. And when I did go to India, um, the Ayurvedic doctor that I studied with, she showed me, they do it in a different direction. They kind of do it down, but some people say to sort of go up towards the towards the heart so it's quite interesting there's there's different ways of doing it but a soft bristled brush is good you don't want anything too hard long handle is good so you can reach those kind of out of the way areas and you don't have to do it every day like it's something that you know i feel like the last thing you want to do when you're feeling really sick and tired and with no energy is get a really hard bristled brush and start scrubbing yourself sometimes it can be a little bit annoying so yeah just choose the things that you like to do and and do it gently and I think that's that's a really great message um, to to pick things that work for you and that really call out to you. Um, dry brushing might seem like the most horrific thing to somebody and might seem like the most magical thing to another person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Same with oil pulling. It's funny, I've been looking at oil pulling now for ages and I ju- it's one of those things I'm like, I'll just do it, I'll just do it tomorrow. And I still have not done it and I... I I need to give it a shot. Mm. I think tongue scraping is really good. That's where you have the little metal tongue scraper and you get rid of some of the white coating if you have it on your tongue. I, I kind of like that as a practice. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, yeah, it is. All these things are easy. What I like about them is they're all easy and affordable. Mm. Um, you don't need to be spending lots of money. And for for so many of us, well, I think anybody that's been chronically ill and often with complex or cases that doctors can't really diagnose, we have often spent thousands and thousands of dollars trying to get to the Mm. bottom of it. And so finding things that we can do that are either free or very low cost, I think is really important. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I was a sole parent at the time when I was really sick. And I remember, yeah, I couldn't afford a lot of the things. So I had to go natural. I had to eat food from the supermarket. So I had to learn how to cook more creatively. I had been to cooking school, so I had a little bit of experience, but I had never worked in the area that I studied. I'd always worked in different jobs. And so for me, I had to kind of relearn how to cook and I had to relearn how to nurture myself and how to look after myself. And that was a big learning curve for me because you're, as a parent, you're so used to doing everything for your family. And yeah, that was interesting too. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd, I think um, as well, it's important to note that we don't have to go and spend lots of money on only organic produce if we can't afford it. Obviously, if we can, then great. But if all you can do is buy the supermarket produce, then start with that. Yeah, absolutely. Start with eating food that's natural versus man-made as mm. the first step. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree with that. I mean, um, some people don't have access to organic food. It can be cost prohibitive for some people. If you can find um, whole foods, I always say if you in the whole form, then go for that. Much better than having a can of Coke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's it's a substance that our body will recognise more readily than it will a food substance that has come out of a factory. I agree. I mean, there's so many things in processed foods that our DNA just does not recognise and can't absorb into the body because they're, they're like, what is this? What What's going on? Interestingly, when I, I did the Supercharge Your Gut Summit, one of the researchers from America who's an amazing professor over there of gut health, he said that our microbiota, actually our micro microbes actually – communicate with each other they have biochemical pathways to communicate with each other so wouldn't it be interesting if you ate something and then they had a little conversation and said you know what should we give her an immune reaction or should we let her go so it's interesting what is really in charge of our thoughts and feelings and what's going on is is your gut that's why i 
I feel the gut's just such an interesting area. Oh, I'm fascinated by it and, and you are as well. It's why we're doing what we do and, and I just love it. And I, it, to me, it feels a bit like the deep space, the unknown space, the final frontier. We just know so little about it at this point in time. And in our lifetimes, we will know so much more of what's going on inside of us. And, and that fascinates me. It really fascinates me. One of the things that I found, and I don't know if you discovered this, um, when I was unwell um, but very restricted with my foods, I'd have these days where I'd just have overwhelming cravings to be what I'd say a normal person. Mm. I just wanted to go and eat a burger and fries or have a chocolate bar or something like that. And I I wouldn't because I was being strict with my diet and I wanted to get well. But when I was well enough to eat those foods again, I remember eating them and thinking, oh, it's actually not very nice. I've been hanging out for eating this substance for six months or however long it was, and I don't actually like it. And, and I found it really hard. I didn't want to bring them back in. Did you have a similar experience? Or how did you find reintroducing sort of those more processed foods if you've ever if you ever have um well my balance my um diet's very balanced now i have i i believe in balance and moderation so i do eat whatever i want um for me i do gut healing twice a week so i'll have my soups or my smoothies or my slow cooking from my heal your gut program and then um i you know i kind of eat quite clean and then one or two days a week i just have whatever i want whether that's fish and chips or whether that's chocolate or those kinds of foods in the beginning when i was really sick i started to get afraid about what to eat because I used to think if I eat this is it going to give me symptoms well my hives because the hives are pretty embarrassing because they're all over you and you don't feel like going out of the house when you're covered in hives and um, so I did go through a little bit of a period of that and then I, I realized that it was starting to become um, stressful to think about what to eat and I was spending too much time thinking about what to eat so I made a conscious decision back then that I would just go moderately and slowly and I did introduce I did I did take out dairy gluten wheat and sugar uh, and yeast at the time when I was really sick and now I've reintroduced them but I don't have gluten that often and I'm fine when I have it uh, when I have it now so um, it just took me time to sort of rebuild my gut and get to a stage where I can tolerate things more and I'm I'm at that stage now it's funny with fibromyalgia though I still have fibro and um, I don't have big flare-ups anymore but it's it, for me it's weather dependent so it's so strange but if there's a change in barometric pressure or it's going to start raining I start to get achy and I know a lot of people with arthritis talk about that as well I don't know if there's any scientific evidence around it but it's a strange phenomenon don't you think I think it's really interesting and and I was experiencing a little bit of arthritis in my fingers from years of playing netball when I was younger and all those, you know, times my fingers got whacked. And before I was diagnosed with SIBO and and treated that, I I would get very painful fingers, particularly when the weather changed Mm. and on really cold days. Mm. And since my SIBO has cleared up, I actually don't feel the arthritis in my fingers at all anymore. Um, And I don't have those sensations like I used to with changing weather which is Mm. really interesting so to me my study of one is that my arthritic (laughs) symptoms were very much related to my gut health yeah yeah that could be yeah absolutely no that's very interesting yeah and I'm sure weather as well because you know why why was that flaring up when the weather was changing if there wasn't uh, something to do with the change in the pressure or yeah yeah it's funny yeah it's really interesting talking just around detoxing your life I think this is a really important thing and that um, it can often be difficult to understand what a a stressor might be what's your advice to anyone listening on how they could start to look at what could be causing stress and how they could address it I think because many of us are very busy and we overlook some of the signs and symptoms that we have in our body or the signals that tell us that we're feeling stressed. So it's really about trying to tune back in. If you have moments when you're on your own, I don't know, a lot of people are very busy so they don't always have that. But if you do have moments to really check in with yourself and do that self-check-in and go, is this making me happy? Is this right for me? I don't know. Uh, And if you do that, it can actually give you 
Because our internal intelligence, I think, is really interesting. If we can tap into that, it can tell you what you need. And, um, you know, you could be in a job that you don't like, but you feel pressured because you need the money or that kind of thing. So it's about really not changing your life altogether to make things to dramatic changes, but finding either ways to de-stress or to cope with the inevitable ups and downs that life will bring us and they do so I feel like there's waves as well like sometimes we feel like um, we can cope with anything and then other times we feel like anxious and things are really difficult so riding the waves um, and just I find meditation and walking I love walking and hiking so that's kind of like my release I just get out and start walking and and I feel really good when I walk things that are just natural and um, yeah free and easy I also love walking. I love getting out into nature and, you know, smelling fresh air and hearing birds chirp and just being with nature. Um, I find it really soothing and it's it's interesting. No matter how crap you're feeling before you start walking, you always feel better. You, you always do, feel you? great. I like have a 20-minute thing where after the first 20 minutes, I kind of get into my stride and I'm like, I feel really good. And I start noticing things around me. Like you say, the birds chirping, the leaves, the change of seasons, the air, the people. And it kind of just takes you out of your stresses you, and out of thinking, just turning or switching off your mind. I find meditation helps. For me, I like to listen um, to those meditations online, the free ones that you can get. Do you, have you heard those? The I, free meditations? I have, yeah. There's and I a listen guy, to meditation apps as well. Do you? There's a guy um, called Hypno Tom. He's got an English accent and I really like him. He just kind of soothes you. I like all of those kind of free online meditations as well. Um, so I do a bit of that. And then just having fun and just letting go and not worrying too much um, because some some things you can't change and there's no point really worrying about them and ruminating on them because, um, yeah. That's a good point and something that uh, in an interview back in episode, it must be four or five, with Dr. Narala Jacoby, she talks about ruminators. So people and how she approaches her treatment, her naturopathic treatment with them on when someone will really ruminate and, and dwell over an issue which will often impact how their treatment will work. And it's very easy to fall into that zone where you just almost spiral into this kind of craziness around how you're feeling, how your gut is feeling, your symptoms, the fact that you can't go out and eat with your friends, everybody else is having fun, you're not, and, and it can be very destructive when you get into that state mm, sometimes. Absolutely, and you can also get stuck in your story as well. And I think when I was really sick and I was looking for answers, I was definitely stuck in my story. I was, what's wrong with me? Who can't? Why can't anyone help me? I feel so alone and that kind of thing. And then yeah, as I've progressed and gotten better and improved my health, I feel like I focus on different things now, spending time with my family, doing the things that I enjoy. Um, it's really uh, freeing to not worry so much about what you're eating and if you eat something, feeling guilty afterwards is not its not great. So um, having that relaxed. I know it's really hard for people who have allergies towards things and obviously I'm not telling them to go and eat something that's going to make them really sick but if you're – um, on a healing sort of journey, taking the time. It doesn't always have to be done overnight. Not everything has to be done straight away. And the other thing that I really benefited from, I think, was that fact that I recognized that I am 90% well and I'm okay with that. I don't have to be 100% well all the time. I'm 90% from where I was. I'm so much healthier. I'm on no medication. I feel fantastic. So I think just being happy with being where I'm at is um, liberating. I think that's excellent advice, Lee, because we can often be so fixated on this end point, which we may never achieve. Um, but if we look back at where we've come from and realise how improved we are, um, that journey in itself is quite incredible. Mm. And if you can turn that around into a positive and help others who are going through the same thing, I think that is uh, very uh, inspiring to others as well. Yeah, and it's and it's one of the reasons. It's the reason why you and I do what we do because mm. we went through these personal experiences and now um, help others through our recipes and uh, our coaching programs. With listening to you talking about hiking, it's made me think about one of the one of my 
um, frustrations recently is discovering that I've got an issue with one of the discs in my spine. And so I've been, I can't do any form of exercise other other than very gentle walking um, on flat surfaces. So going for hikes, which I absolutely love to do with my partner, I can't do at the moment. And I found that really quite frustrating because I, you know, I love to get out. Um, so it's, like you say, it's where you are in your journey and, and recognizing where you've come from. And and it's a little signal to me at the moment that, you know, I need to go back and um, re-fall in love with flat surface walking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and doing very gentle things that my back can cope with. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my gut isn't my problem anymore, but my little spine's like, hello, it's now <laughs> time to focus on me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you could just work within the parameters that you have and um, enjoy the flat surface walking I think that's fun yeah exactly and you know like like you said there's no end point and um and it's just you know every day is just a new day and we just take we just need to roll with the punches take yeah. with it what we, with can, we can yeah <laughs> that's my motto <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's talk about food because you have written just an enormous wealth of uh cookbooks um what is your um favorite type of food to eat when it comes to gut health for gut health, I love turmeric actually. So I do have a recipe in my book. I have lots of turmeric recipes, but one in particular in my book I have at night time, which I find so soothing. It's really nice. It's called the anti-inflammatory toddy. And so what I do is I get some milk and I pop it on the stove. Any kind of milk, you can use coconut milk. That's pretty good for the gut. Or you can use almond milk or normal milk or whatever kind of milk you like uh, and you can tolerate. So I pop that in a saucepan on the stove um, and I pop in about, about half a teaspoon um, of turmeric and then I I add a cinnamon stick and cardamom and nutmeg and a bit of black pepper, whatever I have around spices, throw them all in there, bring it to the boil and then I turn it off and just let it sit and then I strain it and drink it and it's the most delicious drink and it actually makes me sleep really, really well. It's very anti-inflammatory to the body and it's very soothing and so I always uh, tend to have a great night's sleep after I've had my toddy. So that's one of my favourites because, yeah, I just I, I'm passionate about it. It makes you feel good. I've made that out of your cookbook and it is very yummy. <laughs> I also love turmeric. I think it's just such a wonderful herb uh, and spice and um, I use it. I love to get it fresh and I love grating it up and putting it in tea with some mm. gin, fresh ginger and some lemon mm. um, and now I can tolerate um, honey when I was going through my active SIBO treatment, I couldn't tolerate it. I would get very bad hives immediately mm. after having honey, which was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, but now I might put a tiny little bit of natural um, honey in it as well. And, Yum. Oh, Delicious. I live off it in winter. Yeah. And it's good for summer as well because you can have it chilled over ice and nice. it's equally as delicious. Yeah, that so. is delicious. I have another turmeric recipe actually um, that I'd love to share with you. Can you eat cauliflower? I you can. Okay. So yeah. I have this recipe where you chop up a cauliflower into florets, small florets, and you just put them on a baking tray. And then you add some olive oil, um, some turmeric, and add uh, – you can add cumin if you want to, but you don't have to um, – some lemon and some garlic and pop it into the oven and you kind of stir it up halfway through twizzle it a little bit about 190 degrees for about 25 minutes and it tastes like popcorn comes out crunchy bits of cauliflower like popcorn it's really yummy you can also put nutritional yeast flakes if you like them which give it a cheesy sort of nutty taste over the top and then I always top it up top it off with some coriander or basil on top it's really yummy Yum. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. That just sounds so delicious. I'm going to have to I'm going to have to go and make that and I'll be posting photos for, of what mine looks like. And I'm sure that for anyone that is listening that can't tolerate garlic, they can just leave that out. Yeah, so um if you have FODMAPs or you can't tolerate garlic, sometimes asafoetida, which is the Indian herb, is quite good as a replacement for garlic. Um, the, another thing that I was talking to someone about the other day was garlic-infused oil. Apparently, if you have garlic-infused oil, you don't get the symptoms as much as you do if you're eating garlic or you don't get any symptoms at all. I've heard a few people tell me that. And the green – is it the white part or the green part of the spring onion? The green part. The green part is supposed to be good, better, better, better. than the white part. So – um, you could try those swap outs or you could just omit it altogether if you wanted to. Yeah, and again, it comes down to where you're at with your current health state and for mm. some people uh, that, you know, they might be able to introduce that. For others, they may have to wait a little while Yeah, and or come up with an alternative. 
You're a very busy person, Lee. How do you manage staying on top of good gut health um, with such a busy schedule? Um, I just do little bits every day. So I try and eat a clean diet when I can. I do my gut program twice a week myself. I've been doing it for four years. I also do a little bit of intermittent fasting as well. Uh, And I find that is really good for balancing my hormones because I am in menopause right now. I'm 50. So I have noticed, I had noticed a lot more sort of night sweats were coming and things like that. And so um, just things like maca, maca powder, um, I had a little bit of that, which kind of helps as well with menopause. And just, yeah, just um, not, um, I try not to pack my schedule out too much. So I tend to try and allow myself a bit of space as well to just, Uh, not do anything at all which is um, for an A-type it's really hard to not constantly pack out your schedule and say no to things it's hard to say no to things but nowadays I say no to a lot more things and yeah I just try and eat as well as I can when I'm traveling it's obviously different but I always think you know when you're traveling diversity diversity different foods this is great so I try and embrace as many different foods as I can. I'm with you with that. When when I first got cleared with SIBO, I was on a plane to France literally a week later and I just loved eating the foods over there and Mm. I ate broadly. I ate everything, everything in sight it seemed like and I didn't have any reactions which was really wonderful and I'm like you. I love tasting different foods in the locations that I'm at because we get to experience different things and I think it's good for our gut as well. Yeah, absolutely. It sure is. A good, um, diverse microbiome. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) Um, The Heal Your Gut program, are you able to just talk briefly around how that works and and who are the types of people that that program is beneficial for? Yeah, it's interesting actually. There are so many different types of people or so many different people who do the program. I've got uni students who do it, people who have anxiety and depression who do it, who want to sort of start healing the gut. I've got people with autoimmune, people, um, you know, obviously with celiacs and Crohn's disease that do it. People that want to lose weight sometimes do it as well. I've had people lose 17 kilos on the program um, and just uh, people who are are addictive eaters have done so many, so many vast different men, women, younger people have done it. And really what it is, is it's based on the four phases in the book and all the recipes are there. But the online program is different because you do it as a community. So you do it with a group of people. There's a private Facebook page. There's access to a whole team of experts, of doctors, nutritionists, naturopaths. Um, even I've, I've even got people, IBS specialists, um, hypnotherapists who help. So there's a vast array of experts as well, which I think is really important. So people can access all of the experts as well. There's daily emails and there's videos from me and contact with me as well. So we kind of guide people through it and they tend to, I've had people do it six times over. They'd love just coming because they feel so good when they're on it. Uh, sometimes they they finish it and it's hard for them they go back to normal eating and then they want to do it again Um, but it's just again it's just about finding that balance and and what works for them so that yeah that's how the program works on the website superchargedfood.com wonderful what does what does life feel like for you today versus seven years ago when you were in hospital feeling miserable what describe what the other side is like it feel it honestly feels so much better I feel like I've gone through such a sort of journey I hate to use the word journey but it really has been of me not understanding anything really I mean I studied nutrition but not really understanding anything about personal health and how all and how health is really holistic it's not really just about medicine or the food you're eating it is it encompasses so many different areas of your life and I think that was a big learning curve for me, learning about stress and learning about how to de-stress and, and change and roll with the punches. I think that was a big thing. I feel like I'm doing something that's worthwhile. I love it when people like a recipe that I've made and contact me and say that um, or give me a testimonial and say they've had my heal your gut powder and it's really improved their digestion or or they've yeah they they're enjoying you know a video where I'm cooking so that's really inspiring and I I get a lot of inspiration from people who do that I love the connection I love the community that we've built together uh, it keeps me going and um, yeah I, I love it so I feel like I'm in a job that I'm so passionate about and I and I and really the recipes come from my kitchen that they're me there I put love and care into the recipes and so yeah I'm all about food and and enjoying enjoying good food 
And I I share that with you. Uh, food is just, it is to be enjoyed. It's so wonderful and it's so nourishing and we can have so much fun with it. And it always makes me sad when I hear from people who are down to five foods. Yeah, uh, Because me they're too. in such a flare yeah. and um, a, a constant flare. And, uh, you know, I really enjoy helping them um, bring back additional foods so that they can get that enjoyment back in their life. Mm. Oh, that's so good. I'm just so amazed by what you do. I love oh, thanks, dis- I love discovering you and your cookbooks are incredible. I'm so excited to have some of your recipes in my new book as well. Um, your recipes are fantastic and just everything you do. And I know I love that you've you've been there as well and we both connect on that. Like we've been at our lowest. And and it's interesting. You can either stay there or you can turn it around and do something positive with your life. And I feel like um, you've really done that. Thank you. It, and it has been a, a, a real pleasure, uh, you know, sitting and chatting with you today and, and also helping the thousands of people around the world that I've been um, helping with my recipes as you do yourself uh, because food is to be enjoyed and, and I love sharing it with people. I love nothing more than opening my doors and having a big meal with all of my friends and having lots of fun and enjoyment and I see that being able to share my recipes as you do as well uh, with people that, you know, I haven't even met is just an extension it's like we're just virtually sitting in houses with each other one big virtual family (laughs) it is exactly (laughs) a food fest yeah (laughs) you we've talked a bit about your cookbooks and you've got uh seven cookbooks out at the moment um and uh, I have long enjoyed your books. What's on the horizon for you? So I'm writing a new book at the moment about maintaining gut health. I have the Heal Your Gut book. But once you, we found that once you've healed the gut, people do go back to that normal diet and sometimes fall off the wagon a little bit. So it's really about how to reintroduce those foods, which is what you do and talk about a lot with your clients as well, and how to maintain gut health long term. So I'm writing that book. I'm going to England on Sunday, so I'll be launching my book in England England and doing a few events there then I'm back and then I'm off to America to launch my other book there that has already been out in Australia the Ayurvedic cookbook and um, so a bit of traveling on the horizon and then I'm back and um, I don't know what I'm doing when I'm back I I haven't thought that far into the future so um, hopefully cooking and making some new recipes (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we all hope for that because <laughs> your recipes are great. Uh, so if anybody would like to connect with you, Lee, what's the best um, way for them to reach out and make contact with you? Um, my website's superchargedfood.com and I have my social media too. So I have um, Supercharged Food on Facebook and Instagram is Lee Supercharged and so is Twitter, Lee Supercharged. And they can just email me, Lee, L-E-E, at superchargedfood.com. Wonderful. Lee Holmes, it's been such a joy to have you on the Healthy Gut podcast today. It's been an, a real pleasure to sit and chat to you. And, and for, you know, it's unfortunate that we, we're not, we don't have a video podcast because you really are radiating good health. And it just is a testament to what, where we can come once we've often hit rock bottom. And I think it's a really nice message for people listening today that might not be feeling great is that there is always a tomorrow and it might take you a little while to get there. But Lee, you are testament that you can totally change your health around and look wonderful for it. (laughs) Thank you, Rebecca. (laughs) My pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed episode 26 with Lee Holmes. If you would like to get the full transcription or the show notes or any of the links mentioned in today's episode, all you need to do is head to thehealthygut.co forward slash heal your gut. And also head over to our Facebook page where we are sharing uh, some of Lee's absolutely delicious recipes. I love hearing your feedback when you've been listening to the show. So do leave a rating and review in iTunes or the app you use to listen to this podcast. Or feel free to message me directly. I love getting your emails. Simply send an email to info at thehealthygut.co with any of your thoughts or even suggestions on future topics. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest and Google+. Just look for us under The Healthy Gut. 
Next week, I am in Los Angeles and I catch up with Dr. Melanie Keller. And she and I talk around her four steps to treating SIBO, amongst many other things. So do tune in next week for my interview with Dr. Melanie Keller. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. And as we are fully funding this podcast, if you would like to help support the continuation of this podcast so that we can continue to bring you future episodes, all you need to do is make a contribution at thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Belinda Coombs for the production editing and original music score of this podcast to hear more of belinda's music head to soundcloud.com forward slash belinda coombs the healthy gut podcast is a production of the healthy gut thanks for listening Mm -hmm.